Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Diversity and Inclusion in Senior Living. And I personally am so thrilled that we are going to have an expert speaker on this topic. But before we go there, I just want to remind you of a few housekeeping details. The first is that you are in listen-only mode. Um, all phones are muted, but at the end of our call, if you've got questions, um, I want to make sure that you utilize the chat feature. Um, any questions that you have for our presenter today, I want you to put them in the chat box so that you get those questions answered today. The other thing is that you will get a recording, a link to this recording approximately an hour after the webinar is completed. Um, and I want to let you know that there are handouts. We've got five handouts that you're able to download and hopefully use as discussion guides um, for this incredible topic. Want to invite everybody, all of our listeners on today's webinar to the Greenhouse Dementia Symposium in, on May 18 in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's going beyond dementia care and looking at a dementia well-being approach. Dr. Al Power is our featured keynote speaker and is really going to challenge us to see things a bit differently with regards to dementia and really bring a dignified approach to supporting people living with dementia. In addition to Dr. Power, he is joined by an all-star cast of dementia experts that will really, really create a very robust, rich day of engaging and stimulating conversations. I promise me, promise you, you and your team will be all the better for having attended. You can get information on our website, uh, and that is on the side of your screen there. So let's move on to today's presentation. I am delighted to have Mindy Cheek, the first Vice President of Greystone Communities with us today. I'm going to read Mindy's bio because I found her bio to be certainly very fascinating. And um, I heard Mindy speak at a women's retreat last December. And after I heard her speak, I was convinced she was somebody that I wanted to invite to speak to our greenhouse audience. Mindy Cheek is the first vice president of Greystone and she's been in the business of serving seniors since 2002. She co-heads the sales and marketing department where she leads healthcare sales and marketing initiatives at Greystone. She has experience in both for-profit and nonprofit organizations. She manages her team and works with clients across the US to help them stay relevant and gain market share in an ever-changing, highly competitive industry. In her position, Mindy and her team are responsible for creating and managing marketing budgets, marketing plans, and marketing studies training in sales, lead generation, and successful occupancy tactics, innovative pricing plans, audits, analysis, hiring and training sales teams, and working with boards, investors, and bondholders. This is what I think is so significant though. She's a senior living industry educator, an education ambassador for the National Resource Center on LGBT aging a housing committee member for the Coalition for Aging, and a TEDx speaker. Mindy and her wife Paige have shared 16 years together. They have two boys, Casey, who's 29 and lives in Austin, Texas with his wife Kate, and Henry, six, who loves to play Candyland at 7 a.m. on Saturday mornings after a long week. The importance of family is strong in their home. They all work hard, play hard, and most importantly, they all love hard. And I, I love that, Mindy. I, I think you end it with what's most important in terms of your family values. And I'm just excited that you're here to share your insights, your story, and, and some perspectives that hopefully will challenge us all to just become better people as we um, live in the, the world in which we live. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mindy. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you all for joining uh, this topic today. It, uh, as you can hear, it's very near and dear to my heart. And I uh, do these talks um, all over um, Texas and all over um, other states as well. 
and we always get a really good response. We always kind of come away with uh, learning something that uh, we didn't didn't know before. So hopefully that will be um, this case as well. So understand we're going to have questions at the end, which is great. So make sure you write those down. So I want to make sure that I answer all the questions that you have and and you walk away from this topic uh, feeling uh, energized to go and and make those changes in in your organizations. So the topic today is um, understanding LGBT aging adults and. Are you with us, Mindy? Sorry, did I lose you? Yeah, you went on there mute for a minute. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so sorry. Um, no worries. I'm not sure what else. What what the last thing you heard me say, but I will just dive in here. Um, this uh, presentation was created by the National Resource Center on LGBT Aging, and as Susan stated, I'm a volunteer ambassador for the National Resource Center, and that enables me to do these trainings um, all over the United States. Um, but there is a training, there is a training ambassador uh, for the National Resource Center um, in almost every state in the United States. So uh, we'll talk about that here um, at the end of this presentation, how you can uh, get even more training in your organization and uh, more webinars if you so choose. Uh, but the National Resource Center on LGBT Aging is the country's first and only technical assistance resource center aimed at improving the quality of services and supports offered to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, the LGBT older adults. Uh, the National Resource Center offers both in-person and online webinar trainings meant to assist you in learning the best ways to create an inclusive, safe, and welcoming environment for your LGBT older population. So let's just talk a little bit about um, the goals of the presentation and um, what we're uh, gonna walk away with and what we're gonna learn here. So the first thing that I would say is don't be afraid to ask questions. So make sure to write your questions down. Uh, we wanna make sure that you walk away with all of your questions answered. And if we can't answer them today, we can certainly uh, send you to resources that can answer those questions. Really the first goal here is to increase awareness and empathy. Um, for the issues and needs of the LGBT older adults and why is it important for healthcare and social service providers to be aware of and have empathy for the needs of these adults? Well, some people or providers may see no need to discuss LGBT aging issues because they think, well, what somebody does in their bedroom is none of our business, right? Or they don't want to discriminate or make people feel uncomfortable. While some of this may be well-intentioned, I'm sure it is, it leaves many LGBT older adults feeling that they must hide who they are in order to take advantage of health and social service programs. For some reasons that we'll discuss uh, today soon, uh, many LGBT older adults are not comfortable with letting others know about their sexual orientation or gender identity. This is particularly true of those who are especially vulnerable, those people um, that maybe are of advanced age or perhaps they're living in poverty or person of color or older adults uh, living in rural areas. Even though greater protections exist today for LGBT people, many LGBT older adults still fear that they will be denied services or be mistreated uh, by their peers and uh, service providers if they disclose that they are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And there actually are a couple of cases going on right now where that is indeed the case. So it is a real fear um, that this population has. And we'll talk a little bit in a minute about the history and why and why that is the case. So we really just want to make sure that um, we make our services welcoming uh, to all people. And I want to provide concrete suggestions for making services welcoming to all. So LGBT older adults have created ways to keep themselves safe over the years. For example, they may avoid certain situations or surround themselves with people they know are accepting and just stay in that small circle. However, when they need health and social services, neither of those options available to, are available to keep them safe and included. It now becomes up to us and up to providers like you to help LGBT 
older adults feel comfortable at their organizations. So I want you to think about in this presentation what, what, there's, what the one thing is that you can do or start doing differently or do more of to be a little bit more sensitive to the LGBT older population. I'll ask you again at the end of this presentation when we open it up for questions, and I want everybody to leave today with at least one action step or change that they can make uh, going forward. So when we talk about educating ourselves on LGBT, we really, there's, there's four things that we're gonna discuss today. We're gonna uh, talk a little bit about key terms, which the first step towards creating an inclusive environment is feeling comfortable with the many terms used in the LGBT community. Many people wanna be sensitive to the LGBT community, but are intimidated by the terminology or maybe they're afraid of accidentally saying something offensive. Well, you'll learn the meaning of LGBT, the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity, and some words that should be avoided when interacting with LGBT older adults. Secondly, we'll talk about the history. The LGBT community has seen incredible changes over the past 100 years, and the situation facing LGBT people today is very different from 60, 30, or even 10 years ago. In this section, you'll learn about the history of discrimination faced by LGBT people and consider how it may impact their willingness to be open about their identity or access government or medical services. Third, we'll talk about some common assumptions. Individual staff members and organizations may make assumptions in their practice and policies that unintentionally exclude LGBT older adults or have a negative impact on LGBT older adults who are trying to access services. In this section of the presentation, we'll look at two common assumptions and discuss how to move past them. And finally, we'll talk about best practices. Making services safe and accessible for LGBT older adults is similar to other efforts to include diverse populations. These are existing strategies for helping diverse populations feel accepted and included in their work and service settings. And these same strategies can be adapted and applied to reach out to LGBT older adults and help them to feel included. So here we go. Let's talk a little bit about key terms. So to begin this presentation, part of the presentation, we need to be clear about the terms we're using. So terms are crucial because finding out how the person describes her or himself and then using their language, not yours, but theirs, are primary ways of conveying respect and openness. Many people are afraid to use the word LGBT for fear of getting the acronym wrong or accidentally using the word, uh, the wrong word um, in the acronym. So to begin our discussion, let's understand that LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. The terminology used to describe LGBT people and aging adults is constantly evolving, as with anything else. It's important to be aware that the terms may have different meanings based on a number of factors, including a person's age, their life experience, and their cultural heritage. It's important to know which words carry positive and negative undertones. So we're gonna walk through some of these key terms together and then uh, write down if you have any questions and we'll talk about them later. So again, LGBT is the acronym that stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. You may also see GLBT used, and occasionally you'll see a Q at the end, the LGBTQ, um, which the Q stands for queer or questioning. And LGBT though is the most widely used acronym, so you're gonna see that the most. So the term lesbian is a woman whose primary and physical romantic romantic or emotional attraction is to another woman. Some lesbians may prefer to identify as gay or as a gay woman, while younger women may use the term dyke or queer. These terms are sometimes considered offensive to older people. So I'd be very cautious um, to use that term um, with an aging um, lesbian woman. Gay is a word used to describe anyone, mainly men, who have a primary physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction to someone of the same sex. Bisexual or bi is an individual who is physically, romantically, or emotionally attracted to both men and women. Bisexual does not suggest that having equal sexual experiences with both men and women. 
In fact, some people who identify as bisexual may not have had any sexual experience at all. Transgender, that's an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and or gender expression differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. So again, transgender is a term for people whose gender identity and or gender expression differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. The term may include, but is not limited to transsexuals and cross-dressers. Transgender people may differ, or excuse me, may identify as female to male, or F to FTM, or male to female, M MTF. It's important to use the descriptive term transgender, transsexual, cross-dresser, or female to male, male to female, or something else that is preferred by the individual. That's where the respect comes in. So transgender people may or may not decide to alter their bodies hormonally and or surgically. So then we have gender identity. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the gender identity is the gender that you feel you are inside. So you're a man, woman, neither or both. For transgender people, their birth assigned gender and their personal sense of gender identity do not match. So what's important here is to understand that gender identity and sexual orientation are not the same thing. Transgender people may be heterosexual, um, uh, lesbian, gay, or bisexual. For example, a transgender woman who was assigned a male sex at birth has transitioned transitioned and lives um, as a uh, woman. So again, a transgender woman, she was assigned a male sex at birth. She's, she's transitioned and lives her life as a woman and she's attracted to other women. She may identify as a lesbian. We'll talk about uh, more on this in the next slide. Um, but homosexual, um, that's an outdated clinical term uh, medical term, uh, really homosexual is more of a medical term, and that is no longer the preferred word used to describe someone who is gay or lesbian. It's actually taken on negative connotations because of its previous use to denote a mental illness, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in our history slide. One word that um, people often refer or ask me about is the word queer, and queer was used as a slur to, den uh, to denigrate um, the LGBT people for many years. Uh, some people uh, have reclaimed that word as a positive term and it's mainly young, the younger uh, population, but many LGBT older ad adults do not like this term and you should avoid using it unless you hear an LGBT older adult use the term to describe uh, themselves. So let's talk a little bit about um, the population. Now, most of you in our space, in our industry, um, know that our senior living uh, community as a whole is growing, right? So we went from that nice pyramid to now more of a pillar. So by the year 2060, we know that uh, we're more of a pillar and we are um, probably going to have more people in, our, in the United States um, over the age of 65 than we have people um, under the age or actually putting into Social Security and Medicare. So as we look at this, then obviously we know that our population, the LGBT aging population is growing as well. So you may be asking yourself, you know, well, how many LGBT older adults are there anyway? Well, it's something that we really need to be thinking about uh, because there are the chances of you working with an LGBT older adult or alongside a coworker that's LGBT um, are pretty good. So by best estimates, in 2010, there were between 1.6 and 2.4 million gay and lesbian elders in the United States. By 2030, uh, there will be as many as 7 million LGBT older adults in the United States. According to the U.S., uh, the 2010 U.S. Census, same-sex couples live in 93% of all United States counties. Even if you live in a rural or remote area, chances are you do already or will interact with an LGBT older adults. This means that if you believe that you're not currently working with 
any LGBT older adults, you may be working with people who are in the closet, meaning they are hiding that part of themselves for you. You almost certainly will work with LGBT older adults in the future. But let's dive in a little bit um, into the history. Now, one of the handouts that I have is, is entitled LGBT History. And um, it starts from the 1920s and really goes through the 2010s. Um, just to give you an idea of all of the events, um, examining the events, some of the key events in LGBT history, and considering how these events may have impacted LGBT older adults um, as they've grown up. So LGBT older adults in the United States have lived through common historical events, just like everyone, um, that, but these, have, these specific events have shaped them as the individuals um, that they are in their communities. So if you take a look at the handout, you know, there's a couple of things, and if you, you don't have it in front of you, just mark this down. But just to kind of give you an idea, in, in senior living, you know, we, we work with the aging population right around probably, you know, in the 1940s. And so just to point out that in the 1950s, the American Psychiatric Association included homosexuality in its list of mental disorders. So think, if you think about that for a minute, and you think about living and growing up in that time frame, and understanding that, you know, if you came out as a gay man or woman, that you would be listed as having a mental disorder. So that was uh, pretty impactful for people growing up during this time to really understand, um, and and that's why that's who they how they, what makes them who they are today and why some people aren't as open about their sexuality as, as other people. So we won't go in um, and read all of the events in history. I'll let you do that. However, I will point out that it wasn't until the 1970s that the American Psychiatric Association declared that homosexuality is indeed not a mental disorder. However, a lot of that damage was already done. So I wanna walk you through uh, a specific woman, um, Edith Windsor, um, and just kind of take a look at how her life fits into the history timeline. So as you can see, this is um, Edith Windsor. Um, you may recognize her actually from the news. It was her lawsuit that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013 and um, invalidated a key provision of the Defense of Marriage Act. So just to take a look at her life, Edith was born in 1930 in Philadelphia. At the age of 23, she moved to Greenwich Village in New York City to pursue a degree in mathematics at NYU. As she was finishing her degree and looking at the job market, she saw the McCarthy trials target sexual perverts for harassment and termination from government jobs. In 1958, she was one of the first women to work as a senior programmer at IBM but she never came out to her coworkers. So none of her coworkers ever knew that she had this secret and that she was indeed a gay woman. In 1967, she got engaged to Thea Spire, the woman who would become her long-term partner and eventually her wife. Same-sex marriage was not possible at this time and to avoid any questions about their relationship, instead of a wedding ring, Thea gave Edith a diamond brooch um, that she wore every day. And you can see that she's um, hanging on to that. In, in this picture. So imagine if you couldn't even wear a wedding ring around for the fear that someone might discriminate against you um, and you had to go to different means. In 1969, um, the Stonewall riots happened in um, New York City. Um, and it really began when groups of LGBT people became started to become protesting uh, police harassment and raids in the New, in New York bars. Many consider this to be the official beginning of the LGBT rights movement. Um, Edith is 39 years old when the historic event brings the possibility of gay rights and the LGBT movement to the nation's consciousness. In 1973, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, as I stated before, removes homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. That means Edith is 43 years old at this time, and she's been told that her sexual orientation all this time was a mental disorder and she um, risked losing her job if her sexual or orientation was ever discovered. So it wasn't until this time that they actually removed that piece of it. 
Um, to this day, there's a majority of states in the country um, that LGBT people can still be fired from their jobs simply because their employer does not want to work with an LGBT person. In um, 1997, Ellen DeGeneres comes out. So it's easy to forget uh, that many LGBT older adults live their lives without ever seeing positive portrayals of LGBT people in the media or very many LGBT public figures at all. Um, it isn't until Edith is 67 years old um, in 1997 that Ellen DeGeneres comes out publicly um, on television as a lesbian. And uh, this basically gave lesbians and other gay uh, people in the world a pub public figure um, and uh, start, they could start bringing LGBT issues into the mainstream attention. In 2007, uh, Edith marries Thea, her partner of 43 years in Ontario, Canada, and Edith is 77 years old uh, when she's finally able to marry her long-term partner. In 2013, the United States versus Windsor happens and it repeals section three of the Defense of Marriage Act and Edith is 83 years old uh, when this historic decision paves the way for the challenges to state and federal bans on same-sex marriage. It's a long time coming, but finally happened when she was 83 years old. So, you know, Edith's story is so inspiring. Um, Edith and her generation were the first people to fight for the rights that LGBT people have and enjoy today. And that being said, we really can't forget that they have spent most of their lives in a world very hostile uh, to their identities. Uh, it's important when engaging with LGBT older adults to remember that they came of a time and an age and a time of tremendous discrimination and many uh, may have spent many years of their life afraid to disclose their sexuality or gender identity for fear of being fired, institutionalized, or even removed uh, from their family. You know, we still hear of situations today where um, you have long-term partners that have been together, you know, for 50, 60 years, and their families, maybe internal families, um, do not uh, want any part of of, um, or do are not accepting of the partnership. And when one partner passes away, um, you see sometimes families come in and strip the other person from all the belongings or maybe even a home if it wasn't in their name, um, if it was in the, their partner's name who passed. Um, and we see a lot of people that you know have struggled in this way and it's really unfortunate that they have to deal with that. So here you see Edith, um, this is her in 2013. Um, and um, when she received the news of the United States versus Windsor, Windsor repeals uh, Section 3 of the Defense of Mar Marriage Act. So pretty historic day um, for the LGBT community. So racism is another barrier for many of the LGBT community, and it's important that we recognize the ways that race and LGBT identity intersect. So people of color who are LGBT have had to deal with both racism and the prejudice related to their sexual orientation and or gender identity. Um, LGBT older adults of color are historically marginalized on multiple fronts and their needs are often under addressed in the mainstream aging field and in the popular LGBT rights movement. The severity of racism is well documented in the heterosexual community but also exists within the LGBT community. This means that LGBT older adults of color may not feel comfortable in either their racial or ethnic communities as an LGBT person or in the LGBT community as a person of color. The changing demographics of aging population mean that all services must strive to be sensitive to LGBT issues along with race and ethnicity. So, so whole separate issue, but still along the same lines. The takeaway here is the this historic a history of legally and medically sanctioned discrimination and prejudice is what has led many older LGBT adults to have a deep distrust, or excuse me, distrust of health and social services. And this distrust makes them much less likely to accept or to access these necessary services, which is unfortunate because they need these services. So let's take a look at some common assumptions and why uh, we have these assumptions and how we can dispel them. So many people want to be sensitive, right, to the LGBT community, but they're intimidated by the terminology or they're afraid of accidentally saying something offensive. 
So often individual staff members and organizations make assumptions in their practices and policies that unintentionally exclude LGBT older adults, or maybe they have a negative impact on LGBT older adults who are trying to access those services. So the first step towards providing sensitive and affirming uh, services is to examine and work through our own common assumptions that we have with LGBT older adults. So the first assumption is that you can identify an LGBT adult just by looking at them, either by their appearance or possibly their behavior. Service providers assume that they can identify any LGBT adult. Many think they don't even know any LGBT older adults. In fact, that they very well may know LGBT older adults, but they, those people do not conform to our common stereotypes of what an LGBT person or what we think an LGBT person should look like or how they should behave. Some people make this assumption, might think, I know that we do not have any LGBT clients because none of our clients look like they're LGBT. So if you take a look at some of the pictures that I have on this slide, all of these people are part of the LGBT community. But if you didn't know that and you just saw them on the street, you may assume that they were part of, uh, that they were heterosexual. So the takeaway here, statistically speaking, you probably already serve an LGBT elder adult. Even if you're in a smaller rural provider uh, or a rural area, um, you'll certainly see LGBT older adults in the, in the future. Um, the first thing, um, you cannot identify another person's sexual orientation just by looking at them. Uh, the assumption that you can identify people relies on stereotypes about how an LGBT person will look or behave. And LGBT older adults may be extremely good at hiding their LGBT identity and may have lived most of their lives passing as heterosexual or transgender. They may have been previously married um, or have children or grandchildren, which is not something that most people associate uh, with um, the LGBT community. When you assume that you do not work with an LG LGBT person, you are in fact assuming that everyone around you is heterosexual or non-transgender. -tra non this may accidentally send the message that your organization does not welcome LGBT people. So assuming you do not serve LGBT people may create a don't ask, don't tell atmosphere, which is not what you want. You do not provide, they may assume that you do not provide a safe place for LGBT people to disclose their identity, and they may choose to remain silent rather than speak up about their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So again, you, statistically speaking, you probably already serve LGBT older adults, you just don't, you just don't even know it. The second assumption is that discussing sex and sexuality is inappropriate, regardless of the older person's, uh, the older adult's sexual orientation or gender identity. If an older person, uh, if they're not generally sexually active, and this is, you know, a lot of way a lot of people think, if, if older people are not generally sexually active, well, what difference does it make if they're LGBT. Well, the first thing to know, surprise, is that older adults are sexually active. Our culture desexualizes older adults, but the truth of the matter is that people are sexually active throughout their entire lives. A University of Chicago study found that most people ages 57 to 85 think of sexuality as an important part of their life and that the frequency of sexual activity for those who are sexually for those who are sexually active, declines only slightly from the years 50 to the early 70s. So this is also important because many older adults do not receive necessary education or care related to sexual health because they don't want to disclose the fact that they are indeed part of the LGBT community. New HIV diagnosis among people aged 50 to 59 increased 32% from 2004 to 2007. If providers assume that older adults are not sexually active, the signs and symptoms of AIDS can often be confused for the signs of aging. So we have to make sure we're, we're um, providing environments that are welcoming and open. So second, it's important to realize that being LGBT is, is 
uh, about much more than sex, just like a heterosexual person. You, you don't want to be defined just based on sex alone, right? If everyone's sexual orientation and gender identity remain as an essential component of their history and personality, even when we are no longer sexually active. So turning from sexual orientation to gender identity, service providers should learn the ways in which transgender older adults may face more challenges to successful aging than their non-transgender peers. Transgender people may or may not use medical interventions such as hormone therapy or surgery to bring their body in line with their gender identity. However, everyone's gender identity should be respected and not be contingent on having any particular medical intervention. A person's transgender status may be medically relevant information. For example, when a doctor orders routine, a routine medical examination for a transgender woman, someone assigned the sex male at birth but who identifies as a woman, the doctor may also need to order a routine prostate exam. It is important that transgender people have the opportunity to self-identify but specific information about a transgender person's body and medical history is very personal and private. Before asking about medical history, staff members should think carefully about whether or not such information is medically relevant, how they plan to use this information and explain the exact level of confidentiality the client can expect. So again, the takeaway here, everyone's sexuality and gender identity is an important part of their history identity and relationships, even if they are not sexually active. So I asked you in the beginning, you know, really what is one thing I can start to do differently to be more sensitive to the LGBT older population? Well, first of all, we can be open to change, right? We can stop assuming that we can identify people that are in the LGBT world. Uh, we can increase our awareness and empathy and we can educate ourselves. So having looked at some common assumptions and a couple of examples and practices, still be thinking about what is that one thing um, that you can do? Let's focus on four areas. And this is where we kind of get into uh, the nuts and bolts of really what you can do it as an organization to kind of change some policies, maybe change some intake forms, look at your marketing and outreach, um, look at your non-discrimination policy, policies, look at how you're programming uh, things in your, within your organization, and uh, start looking at, and at ways maybe you can change some things uh, to help people uh, understand that uh, you are open and affirming and you want to make these changes. So let's look at policies first. So when we look at non-discrimination policies and resident bill of rights, these are two areas that um, you really should look at and see how the discrimination, what is included in that dis dis discrimination. Make sure to change that to include that your discrimination policy includes sexual orientation as well as gender identity and gender expression. Same thing with your resident bill of rights. Again, change those to include sexual orientation and gender um, identity and expression. These are two easy ways, two easy policies uh, that you can change. When we look at resident procedures and forms, you know, we'll just take a look at um, how we can make some just small tweaks uh, to where it, when somebody is filling out a form, they can tell whether or not your organization has really thought about um, the sensitivity around this, uh, around uh, around the LGBT community. So when we look at, you know, uh, policies around residents making discriminatory uh, comments to one another, do you have a procedure around how you will handle that in your organization? Or when staff makes discriminatory comments to residents, it does happen. Or when residents make discriminatory comments to staff, we see that a lot within um, race in a lot of our communities. But the same can be said uh, for people in the LGBT community. So we wanna make sure we do talk about this and we have procedures and policies around this. So do you have a policy on transgender residents using preferred pronouns and name of choice? So again, if you have a male uh, or a person that was um, a male at birth but now identifies as a woman, 
how are you um, allowing that person to identify themselves on certain intake forms? Do you have equal visitation rights to LGBT residents and their visitors? Believe it or not, when when we um, look at and, and I'm a part of a, a part of the Coalition for Aging in Dallas, we actually have a housing guide and we surveyed um, several communities that were interested in becoming more LGBT inclusive and open and wanting to target this demographic. And we looked at their different policies and a lot of these um, policies did not um, did not exist. So we, we helped them write new policies or tweak their forms so they could be more inclusive. Another one, um, the option for a transgender resident to disclose information on gender identity or preferred pronouns or name of choice, again, on intake forms. The option for, for unmarried couples to identify their relationship on intake forms. So instead of having spouse, maybe you have partner or relationship status. When we look at outreach and programming, you know, we look at um, different buckets. So developing a marketing or advertising or outreach initiative to target um, the LGBT population. Um, include different images of LGBT individuals in your senior housing promotional materials, and I'll show you some examples of how you can do that. Um, offer LGBT themed programming services or events for your MIR residents. And again, um, in some of the, the handouts that you have, it has it lists certain examples of what maybe those programming and, and events might look like. Maybe you post LGBT flyers or other media or resources in a public space that if somebody is, is coming into your organization and touring, they have an opportunity to see that, which, in, which gives them the assurance and the peace of mind to know that they are in a safe place. So let's take a look at some of the LGBT images that some of the communities that I work with have actually changed, put on their websites. Maybe they put it on a specific uh, marketing piece um, that they wanted to target um, an LGBT community or through maybe an LGBT specific um, uh, newspaper or other um, public uh, resource guide. Um, so just some different examples of how you can put images um, on uh, some of your marketing materials um, that are uh, done well and uh, tasteful. Um, another example of um, just putting some different diversity and inclusion symbols um, maybe on, on the entrance into your organization or on your website, or maybe it's listed, you know, on your collateral materials as well. You've even seen some communities where they've taken their logo to their community and, and made their logo part of uh, in, in the rainbow colors. So again, that speaks to the LGBT community that they are in a safe um, and uh, welcoming uh, place. And again, offering sensitivity training, I think is very, very important. You know, we're talking about this today. It's kind of the first step. I don't know what other steps that you've taken. We can talk about that um, here in a bit. But when we look at training, you know, I had somebody ask me, I know Susan mentioned that um, I spoke at the women's retreat. I actually had someone in the, in the audience that asked me, when we talk about training, is this really from, does this start at the CEO level or does this start at the ground um, ground level, and really the the best answer is that is is it has to it 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 can't just start in one place and and try to trickle around. We have to incorporate everybody. It ha everybody has to be on board, and you have to really incorporate your training so that everyone's getting the same sensitivity training. Your staff members, uh, your families, your residents, the providers that you work with, they're coming in and out of your organizations. Uh, your prospective residents and family members, but hosting uh, different educational training, such as the one I'm doing today, um, just gives people an idea of, of really how to be more understanding. Now, I, I'm a firm believer that when someone is, is negative about a topic or discriminates about an individual or maybe um, uh, just a, a different topic of choice, it's really because they don't have enough information around it. You know, as Maya Angelou that said, you know, when you when you know better, you do better. And I firmly believe that. And we're trying to get as much education as we can out into the community so we can provide um, we can provide uh, welcoming places and um, 
uh, to our uh, to the people of the LGBT community. So um, with that, um, Susan, I would love to open it up for questions or or comments that anybody may have. Mindy, this was fantastic. And while we're waiting for the questions to pop up in the question box, um, and I would encourage people to please put your questions there, um, could you explain a little bit the um, handouts that you have for us? I think, yes. you know, as I was taking notes as you were talking, but I, I think, you know, what does it take really to become more um, certified as LGBT inclusive and not just throw the label on, but to to really make sure that the sensitivity training is there, or is mm -hmm. there a process or um, to really make sure that that happens? Sure, great, great question. And I think, again, it goes back to really looking at your policies and procedures first, really looking at your intake forms. Um, one of the handouts that um, you have is a, um, is a, it's called an NRC guidebook, and it's really the National Resource Center guidebook, and it's a practical guide to creating a welcoming LGBT organization. In the guidebook, you're gonna see a lot of these same things that I talked about in this presentation, but it's gonna go into a little bit more detail about you know, how do you make the right first impression, um, and again, in, including photos of, of same-sex couples on your marketing and outreach materials, even on your website. Um, maybe hanging inclusive pictures um, or symbols in uh, where that are highly visible in your organizations um, but really you know looking at you know how can we take a look at how we're promoting our services to the general public and what are we saying and is if you're looking at your websites and you're looking at your marketing materials you know what would you see if you were somebody an outsider looking in how would you look at that how would you you know, what would you think about your organization if you were indeed a person in the LGBT community? So something as simple as putting um, a, a rainbow flag um, emblem on your collateral material speaks volumes. But to your point, Susan, I think we can't just slap a logo on a marketing piece and expect that our community is going to be welcoming, right? Because we have a lot of people that work in our communities. We have a lot of residents. Um, in our senior living communities and and uh, board members and providers that are coming in. So really it's it's all about the training. I think again, this is the first step in educating yourselves on what it does it take for you to become more sensitive uh, to the needs of the LGBT community and really taking this training um, out to your residents, to your staff members, to your board of directors, to your C-suite, to whomever that may be, and really trying to educate everybody so we're all on the same page. Uh, again, for me, it's all about education, but it can't just be education to one entity, to just your staff members, because we all know if you've ever, you know, if you're working in a, in a senior living community, you know, you always have that group of, of, and I hate to say this, but you always have that group of mean girls, you know, that sit at the dining room table, you know, it's, it's those residents that we have to educate and help them to get uh, to a better place of understanding and sensitivity. And you're not gonna do that unless you bring in sensitivity training. So that's a key, key piece in really becoming um, um, an LGBT uh, welcoming community is, is the training piece. Uh, you have to start there. And then uh, really looking at your intake forms, how you are posing questions, how you are um, um, giving options on how they can answer questions. Um, so all of those things have to be looked at from your resident bill of rights to your policies and procedures. Well, that was, yeah, there, there's a lot there and I so appreciate the, the fact that it, the education has to go um, to all stakeholders. And um, mm -hmm. when you talked about the mean girls in the, the dining room. I mean, <laughs> I, I just, I had flashbacks back to, um, <laughs> <laughs> to those days, I mean, you know, working in senior living community, you know, we all know what that's about. So this is somewhat related, but a question has popped up, and I know in greenhouse um, homes, we we've, we've actually asked this question a lot. Would LGBT people prefer to live together in their own wing, their own home, their own household per se, or mixed throughout um, this 
the skilled nursing community or the assisted living? <clears throat> that's that's a great question, and and I think that's a um, that's a fair question. I, I would I would answer that, and you know we've done a lot of surveys with um, the LGBT aging population, and there has actually been uh, several attempts. Um, one in, in particular in Portland. There was another in in um, I believe it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where they providers have tried to build LGBT um, uh, exclusive communities. And I, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I'm I'm part of the LGBT community. Um, I personally would like a little diversity in my life. I don't want to just live um, with people that are LGBT. I think you know we all learn and and uh, can respect people of all different beliefs and and um, uh, diverse backgrounds. I, I think you know the the when we did the survey, um, the majority of of people did not want to be um, in one particular area. They they almost the really the feedback really almost came back that. Um, it was almost more of a segregation when you do that and um, more of an opportunity for people um, that were going to uh, discriminate or have a negative uh, views, you know, it would almost give them the opportunity to do that even more. So um, based on that survey that uh, that was conducted, you know, I would I would say no, that that you know, most of the LGBT people that we surveyed, uh, the majority would prefer to live among uh, diverse backgrounds. Yeah, I think that, you know, from the conversations that we've had in Greenhouse, I think that was kind of where we landed as well. And in mm -hmm. conversations that we had more anecdotally, but it was, we have been segre segregated and marginalized most of our lives. And mm -hmm. this only mm -hmm. perpetuates um, being marginalized or segregated and you know unintentionally I, I'm sure but just saying you're different and you need your own house because you're different from the rest and um, that was not really helping the cause so it sounds like you know the the real goal is the sensitivity training to all stakeholders to really ensure that we are um, creating inclusivity and really policies, procedures, and awareness to, that really invites everybody to live um, together in diverse communities. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, we each have to step back because even when, even when you do put the policies in place, even when you do change your discrimination policy and your resident bill of rights, let's say you do the training, you still have turnover um, you still have um, people coming in and out. You have residents moving in and out, and so it's 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 an ongoing piece, just like it would be for any other type of education or training. So I think that's an important piece to mention as well, is that it's just not a once and you're done. It's it's an ongoing piece that we have to continually look at, look look for, and eventually I think we'll see. Um, we'll see some regulations, federal regulations around this. In the state of California, there is already um, regulation, state regulations that mandate that you have to change your discrimination policies and your resident bill of rights. Unfortunately, that doesn't trickle down to every state. Um, so just understand too your your state policies. Um, we still have plenty of states in the United States that do not have any discrimination policies against the LGBT community, which is unfortunate. Um, my hope is that that changes um, and that we continue to move forward and not backwards. Um, but, you know, time will tell on that piece. But I think, you know, it takes us one person at a time uh, to be the person that can make that change in our organizations, in our personal lives as well, um, in our organizations and, and to those people that we come in contact with every day. So how do you deal with resistance? Um, you know, we talked about the mean girls, and mm -hmm. so how, you know, as you're doing this uh, sensitivity training and so forth, and you've got that group that is resistant, um, how, what are some strategies to really help bring along those that might have resistance? Right, and I think that's where your discrimination policy comes in, um, to really help them understand that you do have a policy in a, in a in a zero tolerance around discrimination 
uh, not just to the LGBT community, but to all residents that live there. You know, every yeah. resident deserves to live in a safe environment, regardless of their background, regardless of their skin color, or or um, whether or not they're part of the LGBT community or the heterosexual community. Everybody deserves to live in a safe and welcoming environment. That's what we all choose uh, to be and, and choose to live. I think the the best thing that you can do there is to you know continue to repeat that. You're you're not going to change you know a person probably that's in their 90s that you know I mean I talk to residents all the time that that tell me you know this is this is the way I was raised. Uh, you can't change me. Um, I can't. Um, I can't be changed, you know, you can't, I've been ingrained in this my whole life. Um, but in talking through, um, sitting down and, and talking to each person, it, it all comes down to really a sense of not um, understanding and, and really just not having the education that they need. Maybe they weren't listening to the training. Maybe they just need a little bit uh, more training um, or more talking points. Um, but sitting down, I think, with individuals and helping to understand why they have a reluctancy or why they aren't um, as open as as they should be, I think is is important too. So everyone wants to be heard. I think we you need to do that. Um, but again, you you have to enforce. You have to put together your discrimination policies, and you also have to enforce them. And I think if residents know that you're serious, then you know you'll see probably less and less of that. I think you know at the end of the day, you know sometimes people you know bark really loud and then and then um and then that you know each day starts to wear off a little bit and it, it gets a little bit easier um, but you know again it's just consistent education and and making sure you have those policies in place you know i i think with greenhouse we always um talk about we create communities where love matters and it really is about placing high value and intrinsic worth on every individual, no matter <laughs> their gender, their race, their um, sexual orientation, gender identity, whatever it might be. So I think you have really just highlighted for us some, some things for us to think about, some um, real strategies to kind of take it to the next level. And I want to challenge everyone who attended the webinar today to really take to heart what you said at the very beginning, and that is to identify one action step that we can take to just kind of move the conversation forward and beyond conversation, but to do something to create more inclusion in our communities. So Mindy, thank you so much for your time and for the work that you are doing. You have a voice that needs to be heard, as I have said. And to that point, we're going to have you back for a second webinar where we will explore it more from um, the workforce perspective and really creating uh, diversity and inclusivity uh, among the workforce. So thank you, Mindy, so much. And before we say goodbye to everyone else, I. Um, Mindy's next webinar is on March 17, and again, it's really uh, looking at the workforce culture and creating more inclusivity there. Um, Ann Ellett will do a webinar for us on sexuality and people living with dementia. So these are all hot topics and things that really have such ramifications um, for the work that we are doing and really wanting to create more dignified, respected, respectable, and um, autonomous organizations. We've got a couple workshops coming up. Um, this is where you get to know the greenhouse communities up close and personal. There's nothing like seeing is believing. There is one uh, March 25 and 26 in Pompano Beach, Florida. And another one uh, is repeated April 1 and 2 in Warwick, Rhode Island. Uh, you can find out more information on our website. Thank you again to Mindy, our presenter today, and thank you to everyone who joined the call, and let's go make a difference. So thanks so much. Thank Bye you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.